So first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to agree to this and the time to be interviewed by NYSEs. We very much appreciate it. Sure. I'm um, happy to I be here. Thank you. I, we, I have a few questions to ask, and the first has to do with what you are actually very well known for, and that is the implementation and advocacy of making higher education affordable. So what understanding about the future of higher education, and for the purposes of NYSEs independent schooling, uh, led you to take this position? Well, I think it's, if it, it's incredibly important for our country that people have access to education, and that includes both K through 12, but also post-secondary um, education going on to higher education. And uh, educational attainment in the United States at that, at that tertiary level has uh, stagnated, and um, I think that's really problematic. And I think making sure that students have access to higher education and that it's affordable for families that can't otherwise uh, pay for it is incredibly important for getting educational attainment up and for making our society more equitable. So what was the process that took place at, at Vassar that um, a allowed you to reinstate need-blind admissions? And is that a process that you see might be a model for schools and colleges and universities? So I think uh, what, what really matters is taking a look at your student body and deciding on um, making sure that you have students from a variety of different backgrounds and recognizing that some of them won't be able to pay the full sticker price and then allocating uh, adequate resources for need-based financial aid so that you can attract students from all different backgrounds. We, we use Need Blind as a way of doing that, which is in the admissions process, we don't take into account uh, the, fam the student's ability to pay, and then we meet their full need once, to, once admitted. But we partly did that uh, as a way of communicating with families that they should think about Vassar, that Vassar was a possibility for them. The real key is making sure that you're allocating resources to meet your objectives in terms of your student body. Was there any special process? Did you have a campaign? Did you have a, uh, a period of persuading trustees and right, families? Right. Um, well, we, we started these discussions uh, in 2006, and it was really a discussion amongst the members of our community, students, faculty, um, trustees, alums, and People were very supportive. We'd actually been underspending a little bit our financial aid budget. Uh, we had a commitment to a diverse student body. We had commitment to uh, access issues. Vassar was originally founded for women who couldn't go to the men's colleges and universities mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, so we, we moved in that direction. I think we were really tested with the financial crisis of 07, 08, uh, because then resources were tighter. Uh, but we remained committed to it. So I think it's building a consensus amongst the community that this is a, a value of the institution. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to shift a little bit and ask you about liberal arts education. Okay. So liberal arts education, um, I think recently has been not promoted, at least not equally promoted, with STEM and STEAM initiatives. And actually some liberal arts colleges find themselves challenged uh, in terms of admissions. Um, etc. What's your view of liberal arts education and uh, the role that liberal arts colleges play in education? Yeah, so I, I think of a liberal arts degree as in contrast to a pre-professional degree. So I don't really like to contrast it with emphasis on science and STEM because mm -hmm. in fact um, liberal art, a, a liberal arts bachelor's degree has always included mm -hmm. a heavy emphasis on the sciences as well as the humanities and mm -hmm. the social sciences. Our first faculty member at Vassar hired in the 1860s was uh, Mariah Mitchell, an astronomer. Um, so, uh, so that's one thing. Uh, I, so I think what it, it's the pre-professional versus a okay. broader uh, academic uh, curriculum. And I actually think at the moment a liberal arts curriculum is incredibly valuable to students. You may be a, it may be a little slower to get that first job on the June 1 after you graduate. If you've done something very pre-professional and have gained a credential to do something very specific, uh, it may be easier to transition to the, to the labor market. 
But I actually think the tools, the crit critical reasoning, being intellectually nimble, that a liberal arts education gives you is going to keep you in a better place throughout your career. Now, it used to be in the United States, you'd get your, a job after college with, in one industry with one firm and you'd stay there for mm -hmm. a very long period of time. That's not the way the world works anymore. And being able to continue to learn how to learn uh, and, and change your direction over time is going to be incredibly important. And we think a liberal arts degree does that amazingly well. Um, when you think about the future landscape of um, uh, education, of, of uh, higher education, and in the case of schooling, of the kind that independent schools offer, do you have any fears about the future? Are there areas that also that you uh, embrace and look forward to as uh, very promising and with great optimism? Uh, both ends. Right, right. So uh, I think the good news is that, in fact, more students are going on to higher education. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, and more kids are actually graduating from high school. So that's a good thing. I think on the downside, um, we, are, we need to think about our higher education system and make sure that it continues to get the kind of support from all of us that it has traditionally. I think what we've been seeing is a pullback on the part of the public, the public in terms of supporting higher education. And that means that it's going to push more uh, towards families for figuring out how to pay for higher education. Mm -hmm. And that's challenging for some members of our society who don't have the resources to make that possible. Uh, so I think where we're seeing that is primarily in the public sector. State governments are pulling back from supporting their what have traditionally been wonderful public higher education sectors. And, and they're struggling. And one of the things that they're doing in response to that reduced support from the state and from taxpayers is to raise their tuition rates. And that's making it harder for a lot of families to afford higher education. So I think that's one of the challenges. Okay. So when you think about liberal arts education, it, it, colleges such as Vassar, and there are a number of really wonderful colleges like Vassar, do you have any fears about the way, about the future of these schools in terms of uh, changes that are taking place in terms of the cost, in terms of demographics, in terms of some of the trends that have been discussed uh, widely. Yeah, well, I think we are facing, we are facing a, 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 a different future. We can look at who the 18-year-olds are going to be over the next 18 years because most of them are here and they're someplace in the pipeline. And that population is changing. It's going to be significantly more um, students of color, more first-generation students whose parents didn't go to college, and uh, we need to make sure that we are a relevant kind of education for a more diverse student body. And I think our schools recognize that and are working very hard to, to be committed to that. Mm -hmm. I'm just really back to the affordability, because it, it is really an enormously expensive undertaking yeah. for <coughs> families. I know there's a generous in, in the case of uh, your school, be blind, financial aid. But on the whole, it's still quite an enormous uh, financial investment. And concerns about um, how, how more efficiently this education can be delivered, the changes that might take place as a result of those questions. Yeah. Are there any thoughts, any discussions at Vassar yeah, so, about that? Well, yeah, so I think there are a couple of things going on there. Um, First, I think one of the things that hasn't really been recognized in this discussion, uh, and again, it'll differ a little bit sector by sector, so I'll talk about a couple of okay. different sectors, but in, in the private nonprofit sector, including the liberal arts colleges, I think part of what's been really challenging for us over the last 30 or so years is the increasing income inequality in the United mm -hmm. States. So that affects us in a, couple of, in a couple of different ways. One is that part of that increasing income inequality is coming from an increased return in the labor market to skilled labor. Mm -hmm. it's, it's for, and that's been driven by a variety of different factors. But uh, people with higher education are being rewarded significantly more now than they mm -hmm. ever were before uh, or for a very long time. Mm -hmm. That means that, and higher education happens to be one of the most skilled labor intensive sectors in the economy. Mm -hmm. So our costs have gone up because skilled workers are doing better in this economy. So that's the first thing. Okay. The second thing is we want to recruit students from across the income distribution, not just from families from the upper end. And that the 
dispersion has significantly increased. The high has gone up, has actually done extremely well over the last three to four decades in the United States. And the bottom has actually gotten worse off even in real terms, not just relative terms. Mm -hmm. So that makes our job much more significant, much more challenging, because we're trying to recruit. Mm -hmm. Our costs have gone up because we hire talented people. Mm -hmm. We're trying to recruit um, the children of those families who have done quite well. They actually want a whole bunch of stuff for their kids mm -hmm. um, and are willing to pay for it. And mm -hmm. our schools compete amongst each other for, the, for those students. Mm -hmm. That drives up our costs. And yet we'd like students from across the income distribution. Those families have done really poorly, and that pushes up our financial aid uh, needs to make mm -hmm. that possible. So that's the very challenging environment in which we're finding ourselves. We can commit resources to financial aid, but basically I think our society needs to realize that it needs to do something about income inequality, or it's going to be very difficult for higher education to do it on its own. And then the second sector, which is the public sector, the rising prices has, have really resulted uh, for, for families from the state pulling back and moving away from a low tuition world supported by um, state governments. Uh, and that's another area where I think we need to recognize that that's going to have an implication for who can go on for higher education. And I'm hoping that taxpayers and politicians will recognize that it's in our collective public good to, in fact, reverse that trend and invest in public education. Okay. Last question. Do you have okay. any advice for school leaders or board members um, in terms of preparation for a future? Well, I think, it's, I think it's incredibly important that every sector of education in the United States contribute to our society's future. And that means thinking about what we're committed to in terms of equal opportunity and social mobility and, and Every sector should be doing what it can to help out in, in that mission. Thank you so much for your okay. time. Really appreciate sure. it. Okay.